we had just one room where the, my father and my mother and the children were living in. I knew everything about like being down there. I, I hooked pure water. I, I, is it pure water? Ice water in Mushi, in Ojuye market where it was, um, they, I remember them calling me, buy your pure water, buy your pure water. So when I go to Ok in the market, when those rich kids are going in their car, I have, I'm at the market already Oking. And then I have to hide my face for, for, you know, to avoid them. This as a child, I have to hide my face to avoid them seeing that uh, by our classmates is Oking Pure Water after school. I remember one of my classmates was telling me he was tired of going to England on holiday in secondary school, GSS 1. But, but I never reached airport before, after, till after NYSE. And I was squatting in somebody's house in Ilupeju in year one. I'll fetch water for them. I'll wash clothes for them to get, to get what? Just to sp spend the night in their house. I'll wash clothes, I'll fetch water, I'll iron clothes, I'll help them cook, I'll wash plates. Did you say how you were sleeping on just the springs of the bunk in University of Lagos? No mattress, just the springs, spring. just the metal springs. Spring, spring, do you want to hear more? Spring. There were days I cried for not having Gary to drink. Yeah, meji. Ah, go. No, 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 possible. Ah. <laughs> They sent me a mail from UK that they were, they, they were, they've been told to hire me for a job. Just a few days after that prayer, I said, me, Igondo, UK. I've not even traveled out of Nigeria. How did UK say they should go and look for bio? They said, it's Buari. I said, who is Buari? General Buari. Who is General Buari? So I took the picture. And at that point, they stole my phone. So I got to my, I told my guy, I said, don't mind them. They are collecting money from presidents. They don't want to give you money. Don't answer them. Mr. I said, don't answer them. Jari. Which president? General Buari. Which will be General Buari? There were days I stayed, I sat on the toilet, in the toilet seats of the plane to make it to the campaign. I was in the toilet. The plane, plane is in the air. I was in the toilet. I was sitting in the toilet. I didn't have a seat. In fact, there were days I said I was not doing. That I'm going back home. The people don't know this. Maybe this is the first time I'm saying it publicly. The, becoming the president's photographer was not automatic because I followed him throughout the campaign. It was because the president then wanted me to be his photographer. Somebody would say, they are speaking Aousa, you cannot learn Aousa. I say, if they want me to know in Aousa, they will interpret it in English. There's no point me trying to know what is not my business. I'll say, Bayo, the one helped by God. Anu <laughs> Only a few people in their lifetimes will ever be able to say that they've walked the corridors of power at the highest levels. And my guest today is definitely one of those very few people because for eight years, he was the official photographer to the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Mohamedou Buhari, at just about 27 years old. I mean, I, I don't understand what this 27 year is. Is 27 the new 40? Uh, that must have been quite the trip. At 27, to be the photographer to the president, and I'm dying to ask him so many questions about that. On this one, I speak to the very talented and creative Bayo Omoburiowo. This is the deep dive. Hey, Bio, what's up? I'm very good and elated to be here uh, and having this very warm conversation with you. I think it's just going to be a good overdrive. Let's just have a chat. Let's just have a conversation and let's just enjoy the beautiful moments we have together. Oh, you book, oh, God. And you let go. Uh, <laughs> uh, wait, look, from what it says online, when I 
to research you, where we research you. In fact, your Wikipedia says it that you were born in Moshe. And look, that that suggests at the uh, on the surface that suggests very modest and very humble beginnings. Although not everybody who was born in Moshe had a came from a low income family. So what what is your story? What's your Moshe story? Is it the typical struggle story? I, I think mine. My, my, my mushy story cannot be categorized as typical. I think it must be categorized as historic. It's, 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 a, it's a movie in itself carved out of uh, maybe designed and scripted by Denzel Washington somewhere. You know, but I think one of the key things was it was ultimate, um, ultimately directed by God. Uh, my mushy story is real grass, not not carpet grass, real grass, like going from the, uh, we lived in one house, one room. We had just one room where the, my father and my mother and the children were living in. Um, and I remember sometimes the only other alternative we had was the walkway to the house that was blocked at the other side and then was turned to children's room. The walkway into the house, into the, uh, face me, I face you, you know, the corridor you're meant to pass. And then it was, it was blocked. They put block here and put door here. And that's where we as children were living. I remember we have to, um, cook just by the door of the house. Um, and, um, it was really, really real mushy, not your regular, mu this is not too mushy, like the real mushy. Um, we, 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 I knew everything about like being down there. I, I hooked pure water. I, uh, is it pure water? Ice water in Mush in Ojuye Market, where it was. Um, they, I remember them calling me buy your pure water, buy your pure water, which is buy your pure water. So it became buy your pure water in Ojuye Market. And at this point, I was in prim I was in primary school, and I was working pure water. And I remember my friends, um, my classmates, who, and funny enough, I was attending a school. That a lot of rich kids were attending because my father worked in university of lagos so i was attending in like staff school because my father is a staff so i was we were able to afford in like staff school which is a story that is an entirely, entirely different story because it gave me uh, i was blessed to have a good ed education so the rich kids were attending that same school and uh, so there was of course we could afford it because there was money for staff children price for staff children and price for rich kids so when I go to Oak in the market, when those rich kids are going in their car, I have, I'm at the market already walking, and then I have to hide my face for, for, you know, to avoid them. This as a child, I have to hide my face to avoid them seeing that uh, by our classmates is walking pure after school, you know, and uh, from there, it, it was just that old, you know, um, carrying kerosene in kegs. I remember one day I was going to fall at traffic light in Ilupeju where I was holding kegs of kerosene. My mother was selling kerosene. And the, the, the bus, the Danfo bus, turned at that traffic light in, in Ilupeju, and I was almost falling out of the bus. But I was holding the kerosene because the kerosene was never fall out of the bus. And because that's dead sentence. How do you want to say kerosene your mother is selling? That I am moving from Mushi to Igondo to go and sell. Fell on the road, you know. So it was really that kind of reality, you know, where we have to walk on Ojuri in Mushi. We walk from... Ojuri and Mushin walk all the way to Yaba on that rail track. So the old rail track, uh, you know, I can tell you how the rail track moves from Oshodi all the way to um, Onyigo, you know, because we trek on those rail tracks. So my Mushin was the real Mushin where I can tell you where the area boys are in um, um, in um, um, Akala, where they smoke Indian M. Um, I can tell you where all the, you know, all the crazy things happen in Mushin. So I'm a real mushy boy, mushy to the core. I, you know, forget for <laughs> no stories, no capping, and no no sugar coating or powder glazing. It was a real deal, and the future then looked like um, I, I we di I didn't see today. I didn't see me becoming bio mobile of today. It is it's not possible to dream of today. But one thing I know is, you know, I think like I said, the movie directed by God. He had already written the scripts and he knew how it was going to play out. And how I moved from that person to who I am today is a different story entirely. Wow. Hey. Uh, look, Bio, uh, before we get to the 
awesomeness and the incredulity of the story you've just told me. Let me just spend uh, a few seconds on your primary school, your elementary school experience. Kids are not exactly, in their innocence, they're not exactly known for their, for their empathy or their sympathy. Yeah. Kids say some of the most destructive and harmful things to each other in school, right? Uh, and, and I should know this. Yeah. Again, because I used to be a child that went to a fairly, what you'd call an elite school when I was growing up. Uh, that must have left a few scars on you. That must have. You must remember some things going back to those days. Uh, you having to go hawk stuff after school. And seeing these kids go off in all these cars. That must have left something inside you that perhaps still exists there today. I, I don't think you can um, discount that reality because again make or ma your 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 childhood or your growing up influences who you become and for me it was a, a decision of who do i want to really become i remember growing up you know a lot of the people i grew up with ended up becoming downfall da drivers or taxi um, or conductors ended up becoming um area boys ended up you know smoking indian m and a lot of times we saw them, we saw them become the, those innocent kids that we all were playing together, you know, playing football, you know, on the streets together. And they ended up becoming something entirely different. And for, for, for me, uh, you know, I was again blessed to have been incubated by the right family. I think that was just what saved, saved us. My mother was such a disciplinarian. My mother was such a disciplinarian that at the point we thought she was, uh, uh, this uh, mama, uh, Jenny, uh, you say, yeah, this man cannot be my mother. I, I got to a point where I said, this cannot be my mother. <laughs> my mother can, this girl cannot be the person that gave back to me. That would, would be, woof. I remember when, one day when my, my neighbor, I, you know, he's faced me, I face you now. I wanted to polish my shoe and I went to beg my neighbor for polish. And she said she doesn't have polish to polish you because I was going to fellowship or something. And I said, ah, how can this woman know that? I know she has this polish. So I insulted this woman. You know, because when you live in that kind of place, you know how to insult. You know how to be very, 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 the use of words will be so wild. So I insulted the woman. And I can imagine how pain the woman is. Because the woman ended up going to report to my mother. You know, you know the insult that will make somebody leave their room and go and report to you. And that insult entered. <laughs> then my mother flogged <laughs> the hell out of me. That in my life, come on. I, she, she was so weak. She, she, then it was like she was wicked, but she was actually incubating the right virtues in us. I remember another day that I insulted my classmates in GSS 1. Insulted them so much that the principal, <laughs> Nuhu Hazan, I cannot forget the principal, Nuhu Hazan, maybe he's a professor now, or he's, I don't know where he is now. Dr. Nuhu Hazan left ISL, left principal's office. Walked for minutes to come and look for this GSS one boy and flog the hell out of me. I still have my mother's car, uh, Kane's car on my hand. Kane's car is still on my hand. Kane, that my mother flogged, flogged us to, 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 to flood sense inside us and everything aligned. And it, of course, that's one, two. Religion also played a, a part in my own story, you know, because we then had to, then we're attending deeper life. And I remember the part like there, you cannot do anything wrong. You must be, they will tell you, they will, so they were speaking sense into, so as much as we could have gone wayward, there was a bit of, you know, because the kind of thing that incubates you also defines how far you go. So for me, I, the, fa the family, and I'm not saying a family that was perfect, but I knew my mother was very passionate about what we would become. And she would always, even if we would have money, she would still put the right virtue in us that will make us who she is now proud of today. And I'm grateful to her that she did not compromise on that discipline. Because if she did come, and she didn't have the LDS of relationships, she didn't have the LDS of uh, marriage, she didn't have the LDS of um, or financial resources, but my mother was a go-getter. She was very ambitious. My mother could sell anything, could do anything, just to make sure that her kids could go to the right school. So when my father was working in the University of Lagos as a staff, my father wanted us to go to a public school or a, a, just every random school. And my mother fought. I remember they fought one day. And my mother said, never. My children will go to that school, that place you are working. That's where my children will go to. My mother fought my father to make sure that we went to um, Unilag Staff School. Unilag Staff School and International School, University of Lagos were where MQ Abiola's children went to. 
Pastor W.F. Kumuyi, Kostaris today, Kostaris of today. That's where his children went to. So these were the people that I was classmates with. So a Muslim boy, but was privileged to be incubated one in the right um, 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 mother um, incubator, two in the right religion that preserved culture, moral, decency, and three in the right educational institution that gave me the right values, the right I, I could meet with people that made me see that the future was possible. I remember one of my classmates was telling me he was tired of going to England on holiday in secondary school, GSS 1. I've never even reached airport. I don't know where airport is. Then my classmate is telling me he's tired of going on holiday to England. Then when I go to visit him in his house, I will see Beyonce, Beckham. And they'll say, hey, there, I'm Beckham. They are, uh, David Beckham. You are David Beckham. You are, how? So those kind of things, you know, unconsciously was incubating your mind to know that the future is actually possible. And you might not be there yet, but at least when they come back from holiday, they'll bring chocolate, bring all this. So you were seeing that the future is actually very possible. And I remember getting to secondary school, um, finishing university. And um, the first time I went for NYC and I was going to serve, it was one of my secondary school mates that was going to airport one day. And I had finished NYC, but I never reached airport before, after, till after NYC. So the guy was um, traveling abroad one day and his mother said, I should escort you, we should go together. Now, so I reached airport, but as a child that has been incubated in the right church, that's how I sow seed. One small money his mother gave me, I said, this airport, me say, I will come. I got that somebody the money at the airport. Or someone say, say, say this small money I have at the airport. See this airport that I'm seeing for the first time. Me too, I will travel abroad. I had never been to the airport before. This is me at 20 something or 23 or 24. Some, no, maybe 21, uh, that 21, 22 days after NYSC. I had never reached airports before. That was I said, ah, God, you will do my own. No, ah, you will do my own. No. I remember when I was in university, I'll be going, I was squatting with someone. So I was squatting. I had to live in somebody's house because I couldn't even afford hostel. I squatted in year one, sleeping on empty bunk. The me bunk, empty metal. I was squatting on bunk. I squatted in year two. I squatted in year three. I, in year four, they gave me hostel. I squatted somebody. I went to squat somebody else, somewhere else again. I squatted all through university. So for someone like that, that seen all of these things and gets a privilege to reach airport, I said, ah, God, you will do my own, no? When I, I, then I'll be going around. Since I was a squatter now, and I was squatting in somebody's house in Ilupeju in year one, I'll fetch water for them. I'll wash clothes for them to get, to get what? Just to sp spend the night in their house. I'll wash clothes. I'll fetch water. I'll iron clothes. I'll help them cook. I'll wash plates. And then at the end of the day, when I come back home, I will see fine cars, Suramogaji, Ilupeju, all these big, big men. I'll be touching the car. Oh, Lord, why should they be no? Oh, Lord, why should they be no? In Joko, why should they be no? In Joko, why should they be no? But all of these things were building something like, you know what? I was, I can't not succeed. I cannot but succeed. You know, and that, that's the summary of my journey and how that whole, you know, everything connected and how God just preserved me from being the guy. You know, I, I, I could have missed it because I remember trying mats, mat cigarettes. We we'll put mat, mat, see, um, lighter on mat, and like this. I said, I said, it just did this. It, it couldn't sit down well. Like this is not you. God just helped me. Like this is not. It can't be you. Oh, holy, no, holy, she no, holy, she no. So that's my the summary of my story, really. <laughs> Bio. Wait, did 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 you say? Did I hear you in that your in that your recounting? Did you say how you were sleeping on just the springs? Of the bunk in University of Lagos, no mattress, just the spring, spring. just the metal spring. Spring, spring. Do you want to hear more? Spring. There were days I cried for not having Gary to drink. I was crying for not having Gary, not 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 shawarma, not Indomie. I was crying that I didn't have Gary to drink. My father gave me five hundred naira weekly allowance, five hundred naira. Out of that five hundred naira, I have to buy um, lecture material. I have to transport myself from. Uh, my squatting hostel to lecture theater. I will still give tight an offering inside that 500 naira. This was, this is, I'm not talking of in the century. This 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010. So there was not, there, there was not, there was nothing that looked like today was going to be possible. But there was just that grace that said, you know what, whatever it is, number one, I still finished with 4.26. The semester I had all A's, one B. 
I was brilliant I, at the point I started. That's where all this whole enterprise started from. Because at the point when I cannot shall kill myself, I started lecturing my classmates. Then God, I was very brilliant. I had A's in organic chemistry. I studied and applied chemistry. I finished with 4.26 CGPA. So with all of this, I still, I, because I was not, I cannot fail two ways. I cannot fail going to occupy water and still come back and then I cannot even make anything out of out of life. So they had one option. I must succeed in something. A, I'm sorry. There's a there's a Yoruba proverb that comes to mind at that point. Yameji. Ah, go. No, no, no. Possible. Ah. Ya jeke kiri ya tuma jelagba. Ah, lisi ye o kubodo shele. Okay, so Bayo, so how do you go from because if I if I chart that chronology. If you were going to the airport for the first time at the end of your NYSC, that meant that between that time and when you became the official photographer to the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria was just about three or four years. Yeah, yes, yes. It was just three or four years between that. How do you go from that to being photographer in just three or four years? So for me, I, I, I say my own story is very, like I say again, directed by God. It's very, very peculiar. And I think I'm grateful to God to have had an accelerated career because i call it accelerated it's not it's, it's unconventional but one of the things i think god was kind to me about is being able to be specific on what he tells me to do part time and he did truly tell me i finished nyc and i was privileged i could have stayed back in portacourt where i served but backtrack a little when i was going for nyc i finished 4.26 cgpa like i said i i, I had networks when I was going for NYSE, I said, you know what, I'm going to work in Chevron. So I walked my NYSE to Portacourt because I wanted to go and work in Chevron and I knew someone in Chevron. So when I got to Portacourt, I said, ah, they, I've called them, let me position, permutation, I'm going to work in Chevron. But the director of the script knew that there was a future ahead. So first disappointment, everybody that comes to serve in River State must teach. They are all teachers. Ah, teacher care. I left Lagos, walked NYSC to come and teach. They said, no, I, we must all be teachers. So, sir, that was how I became a teacher. And that was where my uncommon expression of photography started from. Now, photography for me started, found its own canvas from the beginning, which was when I was in the University of Lagos. And there was nothing. There was no mula. So I had to uh, be borrowing camera and say, because we were going for fellowship events. So I'll borrow camera and say, please, give me camera. Let me photograph you people. You own camera, but you are shy. You cannot stand. Me, I don't own camera, but me, I can stand in front of anybody. So give me your camera. Let me use it to take picture. And that's how I was using people's camera to experiment. Then I'll give them the memory card. I'll copy the file, give them the me memory card and the camera. And that was how I, you know, I was able to find small, small change in, 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 in final year, towards the final part of the University of Lagos. So when I went for NYSC, I started, you know, passionate about this photography and I took it very serious. And when my NYSC um, um, in camp, everybody wanted my pictures. So to the point that even the photographers association in the camp, you know, all the photographers in the camp did meeting on my head. I think that's where I should have known that I am on my logo. All photographers in NYSC did meeting over this boy. He said, this boy is spoiling market for us. I've not gone to any photography school. I've not learned photography from anywhere, but just natural skill of photography. Everybody wanted my picture. And that was how the whole thing started. Everybody started paying attention. Okay. I will take picture. I will give somebody. One of them that were doing meeting, I'll give them memory cards. Go ahead and print the picture. You will collect memory cards. Go and print the picture. I'm bringing the picture. I will sell it for all the coppers. And then I was wondering, like, why is everybody screaming about my picture? And that was where the old thing about taking photography serious came from. I became friend with the DG of our NYSC. Ah, DG that everybody used to get scared of. DG called me to her house, say, your clinic, what should I cook for you? Ha ah, ha. Eh, the NYSC, DG. I became friend. So I saw this thing is really interesting. Then I went to print pictures at a photography lab. And the owner of the lab called me and said, ah, he likes me because I was wearing copper uniform. Oh, can you? He? he started putting me, you know, putting me, um, in in touch it was it was you know teaching me and that was how the whole thing you know um became serious i took it serious we were going for rural rugged in in in, in nyc then and then from village to village i started that was where my documentary skills started building because we we're going to villages and i was telling stories of which those pictures are relevant for me today this is 2011. so my journey from 
NYSC, and I, when people say NYSC is bullshit, I say no. NYSC was what found me. NYSC was where what shaped who I am today. That was the foundation. Because then I began to realize that as much as I studied pure and applied chemistry, and I, 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 I did very well, I realized I was naturally connected to photography, naturally. I didn't go to a photography school, yet I could take amazing pictures that they were doing meeting on my head. I didn't need to, so I then began, began to take it serious, and I started building that career, you know, intentionally. And then I started doing wait and get. I went from, and this, because people don't understand, there has to be a journey, there was a journey for me. I left Port Harcourt to go and do wait and get. I squatted, again, I'm a professional squatter. I squatted from um, Port, uh, um, Port Harcourt, squatted in luxurious bus with some people because I couldn't pay the luxurious bus. They were going for MBA conference. I squatted in that luxurious bus from Port Harcourt to Kaduna to go and do wait and get photographer. So I will go to the conference. I'll take picture. I'll start looking for the people that own the picture. Then sometimes they would have gone. I start looking at the picture and looking for the owner. Sorry, sorry, you're one of you're one of those people. Pack, pack, pack. Weddings and all pack, of pack, that. Pack, pack. I did pack, I pack, pack. pictures. I did pack, pack, pack. Photographer. I went. No, my own was not those people. Me, I went from Portacot. I traveled journey for hours from Portacot to Kaduna to go and do wait and get. Then I will come back. I'll be looking for the people. Ah, this man has changed seat. The conference has finished. Section A or first session has finished. They have changed their seats. I came back home with a bundle of picture like this that was unsold. I returned it back home. I said, ah, well, we said, from the conference, I'll run and print, run back, use keke a bike, uh, motorbike to come back, everything shot. And then from there, but at the point, I had a choice of managing the small, small 15 era, 14 era. I was doing wait and get four by six, five by seven. So I'll be selling to coppers. I'll be selling to them. So I was making small, small change. So I was happy. You know, someone that has suffered so much, when you see small change, you think life has happened to you, the best thing has happened to you. So I was thanking God that at least now I can pay, buy Indomie and Suya. And I was a big boy, Indomie and Suya in coppers, among coppers. But God said there was more. So I knew God was telling me, leave Portacot. Because a lot of the people I was serving with wanted to stay back in Portacot because Portacot was an oil and gas industry. A lot of people wanted to stay back. But I knew God told me, go back to Lagos. And I came back to Lagos and there was this future um, um, red media. They were doing one photography training. And then I just... That was my first time of entering flights because I knew if I should go by road, I would miss that training. So I entered flights by first time. I, it was when I was living NYC. And why? They have paid us Alawi. That last money they will give you after NYC. So I had money from that Alawi. So I used it to enter flights for the first time to quickly come for training in Lagos. And that's how I started. After a few weeks of the training, self, that's how they said it was um, Nigerian Idol that they needed photographer for Nigerian Idol. As I was leaving the training, I just saw them holding one car, say, oh, I just overheard them say they are looking for a photographer that will go and help them catch on Nigerian Idol. I said, I will go. He said, no, 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 we have a photographer we use. You know, you, you can't, I said, I will go. I, I will go, I can go. But, but I didn't know what I was saying, you know, because even the thing, it never entered head where I said, I will go, let me just go. I took bike from Suru Lady to Unilag to go and borrow camera from one of my friends. I carried the camera, I ran from Unilag Took bike. I don't know how I even reached Ojodu, Bega, somewhere around there. They were doing Nigerian Idol um, season. I can't remember which season. I just did that. Pack, 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 pack. I just they stop everything. I one man. One wait and get like me. Or John, or someone photographer. I just say, bros, no be so then they do them now. You just they do pack, 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 pack. I said, bros, the ginger just, they make I just they do pack, 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 pack. I just like say I don't reach here. The man has started explaining to me, no, do it like this, do it like this, do it like this. And that's the power of unknown angels. And that was where my photographic career took a leap and then i started i started pushing i'll go for red carpet events uh, whiskey album launch i was there mbg and i was there red carpet sister please can i take you um uh, pa, 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 pro max um sister can i take you like, no no excuse me no, no i don't want your picture i said yeah now wow sister please can i take you oh no no i don't want your picture I took picture to the point that today now people are asking, can I just put your logo on the picture you did not take? But then people did not want my picture because they didn't know who I was. And that was how we were just building this career wood. I can photograph for anybody as long as it gives me the privilege to learn. So when you say four years, four years happened because I was aggressive about learning. I, I, I Every opportunity to learn. If you tell me, come and take picture, I will come. Even if you are not paying me, I will come at for free. I would come because I really needed to know what I was doing. I needed to learn. 
Like the one that I said, Nigerian Idol. Nobody paid me, but I just found it as an opportunity to learn or to express myself. And for three years, that was what I was doing. I was finding every opportunity to express myself. There were days we trekked from Unilag because I came back to Unilag again to squat. After NYSC, I came back to squat as a graduate that had finished NYSC to squat in Jaja to learn how to use Photoshop from somebody else. So there were days that they would close the gate of Jaja. I would go under the gate. As a graduate, sir, I finished NYSC. I would go under the gate to go in just because I wanted to learn how to use Photoshop. We were about eight in one room, one tiny room. We were eight in that room. I was sleeping there because I wanted to learn. So four years happened because I was aggressive about learning everything I needed to learn. I was ready to work for anybody for free as long as they gave me privilege to learn. And that was how everything happened. And four years, like you said. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so I'm laughing because I, because I know the gate of Jaja Hall. Exactly. <laughs> so when you say... When you say you crawl under the gate of Jaja, that's why I can I can relate to that. Really, that's okay. That's something else. Okay, so you're doing all of this, right? So how do you come to the attention of uh, President Muhammad Buhari's team? So in in, in 2014, um, 2011, I was NYC. I came back from NYC. 2012, I was doing all the red carpets. Then I was in. Um, wedding photography. I was in all kind of. I did wedding. I did burial. I did uh, Wolimo. I did freedom. I did the coma. I did everything. But I got to a point where I felt no, no, no. There was more to me than what I was doing. And I remember then I wanted to tell stories. And we went on a series on Bella Niger, which is still there. Three Musketeers. So I col collaborated with two of my friends, and we started photographing real life stories of everyday people, which was different from what Bella Niger was known for. Bella Niger was known for red carpets. And then we were bringing this real life story to Bella Niger. So Bella Niger took those photos and the text we did, I started putting it on their page. And then it got a lot of traffic because people were seeing everyday women against the backdrop of what they were used to, which is red carpet women. So, we, so people were really paying attention to that story. So we're doing different series. Again, it brings to the power of collaboration. So three of us collaborated and and then after a while, I said, you know what? I didn't want to be a wedding photographer again. I wanted to now be a proper documentary photographer and a storyteller. And my friend said, no, Bayo, it's not possible. Do you know what you're saying? Do you know how much they're paying me for wedding now? Because both of us were doing wedding photography. I said, no. I said, I'm done with, this, with wedding photography. I need to focus on, because then we used to write on our business card, streets, and wedding photography. We're doing street photography. We're doing wedding photography. So I said, no, yeah, I would rather take the streets, which is the documentary route. Yeah, and he was like, no, but you don't know what you're saying. At this point, I'm earning 750,000 naira from wedding. This is 2012, 2013. So I was like, ah, even me, I went back. I said, ah, wait, wait. Oh. This part I'm actually going to. <laughs> I've not seen a single person that I can define as successful in this path. But I knew my art was saying, go this way. So I went to God, like that uh, 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 scripture in the Bible, and turned my face. I said, God, if truly this is your will, you must show me a sign. Because it's a difficult decision to make. Everybody in this area is making it. They look good. They are brilliant. They are buying cars. This part you are telling me to go is like a wilderness where nobody is in that wilderness. Nobody in that wilderness seems to me like they were making it. Do you know what happened? They sent me a mail from UK that they were, they, they were, they've been told to hire me for a job with an international organization. Just a few days after that prayer, I said, ah, uh -uh. they said, they invited, they, they invited me for a meeting in their office, an international company, DFID, Department for International Development, which is UK aid, United Kingdom, um, uh, UK aid, I, I, I don't know how to, how to, but Department for International Development, which is a UK government um, um, institution. They were having a project in Nigeria, which they call GEMS 2 and 4. And it was focusing on the real estate industry of Nigeria and the development in the real estates and all, um, all, all of that development in um, wholesale and retail industry in Nigeria. So they were looking at telling stories of that whole thing. So they were going to go to, um, um, go to, uh, yeah, um, so it, it was a whole project that they needed a storyteller and they wanted me to come on board. But guess what? What was funny? 
They said, we'll interview all the big names. And they mentioned the big names in Nigeria at that time in photography. But we've been instructed to go and look for you and hire you. We will interview every other person because we need to fulfill all the formalities of our processes. But it is you that we've been instructed to hire. I said, me, Igondo, UK. I've not even traveled out of Nigeria. How did UK say they should go and look for bio? That was when I knew there was something about direction. I knew God was truly saying, go this direction. I started working with them. And I was working with foreigners. Ah, they were paying me. We travel, we stay in big hotel, we fly. Ah, I said, hey, wait, what is not they change? Oh, we are not drinking coffee. And we are drinking, we're eating, you know, staff will come, can I clear your ah, Hey, this is done, they, don't they be like, say, since don't they change you. <laughs> and how much were they paying me then? 33,000 naira. But then, 33,000 naira, this 2012 was a big deal. Per day, per day. So I felt good. 33,000 naira per day. So when you accumulate all your days, ah, I said, good. Bros, I did this thing, you know, to the point that my friend that said I should leave wedding photography started asking me, Baba, I beg that thing, eh? Space did that place. So that's when I knew that, ah, truly, <laughs> God was leading me in a good direction. <laughs> so I moved, and guess what? After 11 months, 10 months of working with them, they said they couldn't pay me again. Ah. I said, God, this way I don't reach my, uh, my uh, celebration point. Oibo is saying they cannot pay me. Oibo cannot pay me. Ah. Well, how can Oibo not be able to afford me? Say my bill is too much, they cannot pay me. Ah, bros. I say, God, uh, uh, I thought, so I felt disappointed. Like, how can these people cheat me? How can these people cheat me? You won't cheat you. How can you cheat me now? I walked, did all my work. They said, my bill is too so much. I said, I'm out. I know, and I know that it shows that there was a sign that something more was coming. Or God was done with that chapter in my story. Again, he's the director. So I went and I started freelancing. Guess what? The first job I was freelancing for was paying me times five of what they were paying me. Times five of what they were paying me. Per day. Per day. So I started earning that. I'll go here. And I started working for Wando Foundation. All these foundations, you know, storytelling. I'll go here, work for Mobile Foundation. Work for these people. True thought parties. I was shooting for all these big guys. Oil and gas. And... But I was delivering good images. I was telling stories, you know. But guess what? God was doing with the DFID project. When I was photographing them, I remember I thought I was a brilliant photographer. And brilliance is in levels. I needed to move to the next level. So when they had taken a picture, I thought I was so bad. That was the baddest thing that ever happened since bread and beans. When the international guys came from UK, they sat down in the boardroom and said, I should show them, do presentation. I had edited all my photo. I said, I didn't care. Your father, I've finished you people today. I opened everything. The guy looked through. Oh, yeah. beautiful picture with good vibrance and color. But this is not what we are looking for. Ah. Something I've been taking for months is not what you're looking for. He then schooled me for just about 30 minutes of what they should be what they were looking for. Baba, that was the biggest leap in my career as a photographer at that point. So I went back home. And spent months researching. I started reading. I started reading. I started reading. And that's why I tell creatives these days, you are not reading, so you are still raw. So I went back to read. By the time I came back with a set of pictures, so in their office today, when they want to reference me, they said, Bayo is the guy that had that his large photos all over the organization. So they printed all my pictures all around the organization because I went back and delivered extremely great images. So when they said they were not paying again, I knew I owned the skill. So I left and started shooting for all these big organizations, oil and gas. And then again, I realized that my art was then ticking for political photography. Because I would go to a newspaper stand and be carrying newspaper and be arguing with and, news, and be looking at newspaper, a newspaper stand. Then I saw the way political photographers, photographers were documenting uh, political figures. Overexposed pictures, sometimes bad. A group photo, they would just line people up together. Then I would compare it with New York Times, Times Magazine, um, 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 UK, Guardian UK. And I said, they will show the um, political leader doing like this, doing like this. Now it is you. Now is the time. And they will smile. They will carry baby. Then our own political figure, they will just stand like this, group photo, say, snap and make with the go. I said, no, there is there's a gap here. <laughs> so I saved all, since I had saved all my money, I bought all the guys. So I started reading. I saw that these international people, they will wear belts. Then they will carry one white lens. Then they will carry one other camera here. So Baba, I carried all my money. 
I went to um, buy those things. But before I bought it, let me tell you this one before I forget. I went to Aro Lawyer to beg for, for um, camera equipment. They should give me. I didn't have complete money. So I removed my phone, removed everything. I dropped it on the table. I said, bros, I don't have complete money for camera, but I have all my, my phone, my everything. Take it. Just give me. I'll pay balance tomorrow. The man said, no. How can you pay balance tomorrow? Do I know you? But guess what? At a point in my career, I had gathered money. So I knew I had to save. I saved money, bought all those big international gadgets. Then I started looking like them, started dressing like them. That's how I went. They just said, ah, um, a political rally, um, fire me, he's doing campaign. Baba, since I have the gadget that those international people are using for political thing, I just carry myself to a kitty. I went to squat with my friend as a professional squatter again. I went to squat with my friend in a kitty. I started going to take fire me picture, take fire me, I was capturing everything. I said, if fire me win, at least nobody, nobody know, they feel recognize my presence. Bros, now so governor fire me lose. Oh. <laughs> I was collecting results like this. <laughs> I was joining them to collect results, collect results. Ah, ah, I left. If I could not finish collecting the result, wait for them to announce the result. I carried my bag and left the kitty that night. I came from the kitty that night to come back to Lagos. I felt so disappointed and pained. But guess what? It was in the plan. It was in the script. Then it was time for Oshun, Ayak Beshola's um, election. Then I carried my bag again. I said, I'm going. I started shooting, 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 shooting. I shot. I said, this time I'm not going to be close to him. Let me just do passion. It's a bit political photography I want to document. But guess what? I was training my eyes and training my hands. So I said, I won't be close to him. So if he loses or if he, I will not be pinned. My bros. Now, so I said, ah, God, why now? I for don't day close to Arek Beshola. At least they for recognize me. <laughs> but there was one iconic image I took of Governor Arek Beshola then. Till tomorrow, you will never forget that image. I still have that image. It was kind of a baby in the midst of all the supporters, and I captured it. So I was already building that skill, political skill. So I came back to, to Lagos again. Started shooting up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And then one day, I saw APC convention. I said to my friend, I said, I'm going for this APC national convention. He said, how would they allow you? I'm not a journalist. Now. I said, Baba, I will make it. I will go. He said, it's not possible. I said, I will go. Bros, that's why I carried my bag, entered there. They said, press tag. You don't have accreditation. You don't have this thing. They were blocking the gate. I just saw him. I just, your brother passed the woman's back, entered Teslim Balogo Stadium. As I entered, I didn't know there was another layer of security. There was just some bouncers. Every bouncer, they were just tag. I said, Kai, I'll go enter this place. I really must enter. So I called somebody, called somebody, called somebody. They brought tag from me, from their colleague. Put it in their pocket. Came outside, passed it to me. I wore it. I entered Tesla Balogo Stadium. That's how I started photographing. And then this man was coming. People were running after him. I said, who is this man? I said, I joined them to take the picture. In fact, I did not focus the picture. I was just taking, let me just, they said, it's Buari. I said, who is Buari? General Buari. Who is General Buari? They said, ah, it's General Buari now. I said, so that, but why is everybody running after this man? Other candidates have been passing. Why is it this man everybody's running after? I said, I took it, say, I don't know. At least I know Fashola, I know uh, Tinubu, I know those ones. But this one, General Bari, I don't know him more from anywhere. So I sat down. Then it was time to vote for the candidates. Then I realized that this same man, everybody rushed to go and meet him again. All the international journalists, AFP, Reuters, all of them, BBC, they were all running after this man. So I carried my camera again. I said, make I snap the man again. Make it not be like, say, maybe this guy is not serious. But it's the uh, Governor Fashola, I know those people. This man, I don't know who he is that everybody is running after. So I took the picture, and at that point, they stole my phone. Ah, I said, God, you know, possible. Huh? This thing, they say, passion, passion, passion. I follow passion, come this place. iPhone 5S, where I, God know how I gathered money to buy it. They can't steal them. God, you go reward me, oh. Because they say we should be following power, all these motivational people. Passion will take you to get passion to profit. Now, I follow passion. Now, passion don't passion me. It has become passion of the Christ. I must get the word for this thing, no. <laughs> Bros, every other person left. Since I didn't have phone now, that's why I sleep for counter. This stand, cameraman used to stay. I slept under the counter overnight. I was there. I was, I slept there. I didn't go home. They came back, counted the results. I was there photographing everything possible. And that was that this same man that they were rushing became the winner. And since I don't know the man now, I carried my bag and went home. Few, that was December. First week, end of December, first week of January, or first, end of December, they just called me and said, are you interested in 
um, photographing General Buari for a campaign that they said it is you that can photograph, that they've checked all the photographers, that they've seen what I've been doing within the political scene, that it is you that can do it. Um, come on. But, and then don't forget, they gave them um, Adebola Williams and Chude Jidonwo the um, the role to do. So they said, they should go and look for me. I said, me. Ah. So I said, how much are you? We started negotiating. They said, they will pay me. I said, ah, they are going to pay me half of what I was earning then. Ah. I said, no. So I got to my, I told my guy, he said, don't mind them. They are collecting money from presidents. They don't want to give you money. Don't answer them. Me I said, don't answer them. Said, Which president? General Buari. Which be General Buari? I don't even know. When me at this street, they photograph uh, on the road. Then one General Buari. But the director of the script knew what was going to happen. One day, I just picked the number and said, ah, these people have not called me since all these days for this campaign again. So they say, I should follow them in the campaign. Let me even call them and hear what they have to say. I said, hello. He said, Bayo, the campaign is starting tomorrow. How come I call them the day before that day? He said, if you don't make it to Portaco today, we'll give the job. I said, so I asked myself, I said, Bayo, was it money that made you fall in love with photography in the first place? I said, no. So even if they're not paying me, I will do it because this is me. So I said, see, discard what that person told you. This is the real you. You want to do this because you believe in this thing. You want to contribute your own quota to, 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 to development. You have always been a, um, a photographer for social change. Why don't you do it? I said, you know what? To hell with whatever they are paying me, I'm going. Bros, I didn't have flights. I had, went straight to um, the airport, took the next available flights, and that's how I got to Port Harcourt, and we started campaign the next morning, and the rest is history. Wow. <laughs> what? <laughs> hey, buy your soul. Look, uh, you were going to all these political rallies, just by yourself, you you had you knew nobody there. You had no accreditation. You had no invitations. You were just I'm traveling to all you. these places just 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 because. It, it was it was incredible. It was, it was it was for me. It was a, a seed. It was like a, a virus inside me. I could, I was so restless that period. I just wanted to express myself every way possible. There are days we go into bushes. Just looking for images. I just wanted to tell stories. I just wanted to express. So it was like a virus. Whether you give money, it wasn't about. It was just about. It, I couldn't hold my. You know, like virus that like you can't control. It was just me looking for a way to express. So whether I got money or not, you know, it was just what I wanted to do at that point. Amazing, amazing. Okay, so um, you must have been the happiest person when President Muhammadu Buhari won the elections at that point. At that point, uh, did it occur to you at that point, were you already his official photographer at the point that he won? When he won, did you see yourself as the official photographer by that point or were you yet to be appointed the official photographer? Was it clear to you, this is what I'm asking, was it clear to you during all the campaigning that if this guy won, then I am the guy that gets to go to Asso Rock with him? I cared less about Asso Rock. I was doing it because I was just passionate about photography. I, I didn't even know what, what is Asso Rock. What do they do there? I didn't know anything. I wasn't even a student of history. What is Asso Rock? I was just happy that I was for, for, I was going to document one historic moment in Nigeria's history where one man was going to campaign. I was going to follow him and I was going to take pictures and I'm going to have the picture and I'm happy. That was all. I didn't, I didn't even know there was anything called the official photographer to a president. So I was oblivious of what was possible. I was just excited that I was getting to document. All I cared about then was passion about documentation. I was just documenting. I was just documenting. And there were times that I didn't even have the opportunity to, even during the campaign, there were times that they told me to, that, oh, um, I should just stay. Um, they, there were days I stayed, I sat on the toilet, in the toilet seats of the plane to make it to the campaign. I was in the toilet. The plane, plane is in the air. I was in the toilet. I was sitting in the toilet. I didn't have a seat. But I would tell them I must make it. I would sit in the toilet seat. There were days I sat down on the cockpit of the pi with the pilots. I'll be seeing everything I did just to make it on campaign. But for me, it was the excitement of I, 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 I did, I'm part of this thing. I'm telling this story. If I did I did not even know what I was just taking pictures. I was just happy. And when he won, I told them I'm going back home. If I did this, I said I was not doing that. I'm going back home. The people don't know this. Maybe this is the first time I'm saying it publicly. I, I, I said I was even when he became president elect, and there was no excitement about being in the villa. I remember it was, thank God for someone like uh, um, 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 T.Y. Bello. T.Y. Bello called me. And I said, ah, mommy, me, I'm tired of this. You know, he said, we'll just be photographing somebody. We'll just be following somebody up and down. Ah, me, I want to go and be photographing real life. We'll just go, real life. 
And she said, by I've checked all. She said, you will do it too. She said, I've checked all people, everybody in our contact. You are the only one prepared for such a time as this. Hmm. I said, ah, I said, me, I'm not, ah, this thing, ah, they, 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 they will tell you, say, yeah, you will use it, tell it, so, follow this one, go like this. Ah, which one is this one now? Me, I'm used to just, you got to get it, or get it, now we will know now, which one be, say, Bayo, you are meant to be here. You were made for this. You were prepared for this. You have to do it. And that was what saved me. If not, I would have turned back. Because for me, it wasn't the excitement of the office, but the excitement of my craft as a creative. I was just passionate about expressing myself. And I think that was also what gave me that fluidity of being able to just flow because I, I, I wasn't looking at Aso Villa as a building or presidency as an appointment. I just saw the president as another, um, just like the way I was going to Marco Co to photograph in Marco Co or the way I was going to um, Red Carpet to photograph. The, 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 this person of General Muhammad Boy was a subject that I was just telling a story about. So whether he's a president or not a president, it was a subject to me. And my focus as a creative was in telling the story of this subject. Whether he's human, he's the president or not, was not what. So the excitement of, was I excited that, oh, he has won the election, I'm going to Villa. It was never there. And I think for the eight years, it, it helped me to balance my role as the photographer to be outside of the scene and not necessarily in the scene. Mm, mm. So two things pop to my mind uh, at this juncture. Uh, the first is just to, un to underscore what you've already said. It was that you did the campaigning for him. You were on the campaign trail. There were times they didn't even want you to follow them, but your passion will say, you know what? I'm going to get into that plane. I will stay in the toilet. I'm going to sit on the pilot's seat. I'm, I'm going to sit in or somewhere in the pilot's cabin, right? I'm going to sit somewhere in the cockpit. I'm just going to get there. The passion was pushing you, yeah? So that, that first of all. Then second of all, he now won the presidency, and as far as you were concerned, you were you were done. You wanted to go back home. You had no, you had no intentions of going back to to, to Asorog, but they insisted on having you. And then T. Y. Bello spoke to you and encouraged you to do it. So first of all, let's acknowledge just what a rare person T. Y. Bello must be, because T. Y. Bello too is a photographer. <laughs> uh, if I'm thinking normal people. They would have been advising you to do exactly that. Go home so that perhaps they can step into that opportunity. But she actually encouraged you to take the opportunity. That's, that's a rare person. I, and I think for me, it's, wow. um, it's I, it, my, my whole journey has just been that support system. You know, because in life, sometimes you don't even have clarity because you, you only know as far as what you can see, you know. And people like that, people like... Um, um, Lukma Olaunik Olaun Lukesh, who was fashion as photographer, you know, was also a big, you know, support. I remember when I went to see him, you know, then I think maybe that's when my interest in the political scene, you know, and I remember him giving, giving me so much advice as the governor's photographer then. And as far as I was concerned, he was the only one I saw as a mirror of what could be. And he was just there to support. I remember him when I was leaving his office then giving me money in, in, in an envelope. And I always still tell him to today, that's, thing he gave me was a big seat to say you know what i believe in you and you can you can do this and again the same thing with um um adebola williams and should they did if they didn't have the platform of red media and they didn't give me that opportunity whether it is whatever structure it came in as but this these support systems have been very very important and which is why people like us also want to stand as support systems for other people to help them become who um, um, they are meant to, to be because the whole world needs support systems. Okay, great. Uh, now let's get into your time in the in the presidency, so to speak. Uh, now, there are, there are different arguments as to this, but I think the general consensus is that the presidency or the administration of Muhammadu Buhari was, to put it mildly and lightly, it fell below expectations. Of most people. In fact, it was so much that the first lady, Aisha Buhari, came out in 2022 to offer an apology after a fashion. Uh, now, you were a part of that administration, albeit in a completely unofficial capacity as far as administration was concerned. You were the photographer, but you were there. <laughs> you were in that administration. In fact, before I ask that question, I think a, a better a foundation question to that question would be to ask, what was your access in the presidency when you were the photographer? Were you everywhere or almost everywhere or were there meetings that you couldn't go into? What was your access in the presidency? 
Well, as far as being the official photographer to the president was, and again, backtrack a little bit, the, becoming the president's photographer was not automatic because I followed him throughout the campaign. It was because the president then wanted me to be his photographer. I remember hearing the back gist that he was always saying, who is that boy always climbing trailers? He's always climbing trailer. He's always running up and his energy is just, who is that guy? He's, he risks everything just to get the moment. He's always climbing rock. He's, so he kept asking, who is this guy? So the first time we, we went on the plane after he won, and we sat down together on a chopper to um, Comrade Adams Oshomale's wedding. And I sat directly in front of him. And then when we landed, when we're going to take off back, he said, Bayo, we are going to leave you behind. He joked with me. I said, ah, General Buari. Gen Do you know General Buari then? He said, Bayo, we are going to leave you behind. Though. You know, very joking. I said, ah, eh? Then we got, so I felt, and uh, there's a book I read by, by Pete Souza, who was for Gary Obama then. We said, once the president knows your name and calls you by name, there's already a level of access you've gotten. Because for a president to know your name and call you by name, you're not his friend. You're not his buddy. You're not his classmate. You're not his, his, in his, you know, in that region. But for him to call your name, the history of presidency and photographer is that they say, call me that photographer. The, the president, the photographer never had a name. Call me that photographer. I say, call me that. So for him to be saying, come, uh, uh, bio, I will leave you behind though. I say, ah. Then we got into the government and then he says, the first day in office, all the press men in the villa who already knew about villa stood in front in the office, that first picture they take. And I was far behind and he said, in front of them, he said, where is Bayo? Ah, uh, first day in office. Eh? All of them say, president, president ask for a photographer. Like, then he's asking for the photographer by name. Then I said, I found my way in and I'm like, I'm here, sir. And he said, now the photo is complete. Then everybody like, ah, like, ah. Oh. So I went out, then that, that was the day they knew, oh, this is a different, this is a different person. This is a different game we are playing here. So everybody stepped back, like, okay, oh, oh hold up. He's like, this one is different. Oh, this one, this man came with his own. He knows who he, he wants. And as much as he didn't care about photography, I think he cared more about the person behind that camera and the person's originality in doing what he wants to do. But beyond that, the access I had was so much to telling my own story about him. I traveled everywhere. He went to an unofficial ground. I was there. Um, every movement he makes on official grounds, I was there. My role was to document him. There are times that the meeting becomes closed door and I'm, I have to go out. Just like every person that has the capacity to record, whether by photo or by video, has to step out. I have to step out as well. And um, that, that was the access I had. As much as I could be in the room to photograph him, we call it established. I could get into the room and photograph him maybe two minutes before the meeting or just steal some shots as much as possible. But whatever access I had, I made a creative use of those access. So I don't have a complaint about the level of access I had. I just made the creative, the best creative expression from it. And I tell people, even if it is 10 seconds you give me, if it is a window, I will use it. And that was the best I used on that and that's the answer i have to what level of access i had oh good 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 adequate answer now now i asked that question and i needed your answer to establish the the distance or the, the relationship between you and uh, your principal uh president muhammadu buhari because the question i was gonna ask was that as somebody who was in the administration and who was close to him after a fashion uh how did you feel about the way the country was going, seeing how the general consensus was that, look, things are getting harder and harder. Were you ever conflicted at any point in time that, man, um, man things are getting tough? Or were you conflicted? Did you feel like, man, uh, I wish things could be better. I wish things could work out better. Did you, did you feel conflicted that, look, this thing is not working out? I wish I could tell him. Uh, I think for me, there, there, there are facts that must be placed clearly. One is that my role with the president was purely, and I, I, I influenced that. It wasn't written anywhere. But my role, of course, my title was written, but my specific role was carved by myself. My role is to tell a story about this administration, to paint an honest representation of what the administration was about. And I say it clearly for the record, 98% leaving 2% for error due to parallax or imperfection 
were purely as it is. So I went there to tell the story as it is. So whether he was a good person or he was a bad person, whether he was a fine person or an ugly person, whether he was nice or bad or, or nice or wicked or mean, was my role was to present it to people. Why? Because I believe that history will judge us by the actions we take. And my own representation of that administration at that time should be as holistic, comprehensive, and as unadulterated as possible. Saying that my children 10 years, 20 years from now should be able to find a reflection of the reality of that administration as a then. Now, that administration being perfect or imperfect should not be reflected by, should be reflected by my image and not be doctored through my presence. So I wasn't there to Photoshop a president. Neither was I there to pancake a president or to present a narrative I wanted the audience to have about the president, but to present the case as it is. So if you review my archives now, you're going to see a president as it is. One. Two. No matter in all of this, I'm still Nigerian. I'm very passionate about this country. Extremely passionate. And even if I have, I've had several opportunities to be out of this country, we are in this country because we believe in Nigeria. And we believe Nigeria has every right to succeed among the Committee of Nations. And we believe every Nigerian has the right to fair expression of governance, fair expression of nation, national development. And I'm an advocate of such. So no matter how much I was in government, I knew I was still connected to the pulse of the average Nigerian. How? I went to the market and people laughed at me. I said, how can you be coming to market? I was still going to market even as the president's photographer. And I go to Orange Market, like Ojuwoye Market. I go there every time. So I, um, I wasn't distant from the reality. So I felt that reality. And as much as possible, I was as uncomfortable as a lot of Nigerians. And at, at every point in time of this reality, as much as opportunity availed me, we sat down in rooms to see how we can do things right. As much as I couldn't influence things directly, even at, uh, during a, a lot of times, I made sure that I made comments. I made sure I... I, I, I created avenue and, and I did my own part to see how things could have been done better. Number three, the president I knew and I was working with was someone I understood who he was. I knew it was someone that really as a person was a very, very unique. His qualities and characteristics were unique. He was genuine about his interest for Nigeria. I know that I worked closely with him. Nevertheless, there are many other factors which I might not be able to present that also add up to the governance of a nation. And a lot of times there are many other components to it. But again, in these instances, my role always has always been, why are you here? Focus on what, why you're here. I'm here to tell stories which I had already carved from the beginning, which is at this point of my coming to the government, I didn't come as an advisor to the president. I came in to tell the story of a government, preserve that story and present it to, to, to preserve, present and preserve it for history and posterity. But at every avenue I had that I could influence what I could, given the window I was given, I made my own, own contributions. And I'm sure some way or the other, it was either Ed worked on or otherwise. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so in Nigeria, we, we tend to think that anybody associated with power on any level, I'm bossy, bossy on the presidential level is made for life. In fact, not only do we think they are made for life, we think they can grant us favors as well. So for example, I am thinking that everybody who knew your siblings must have assumed that your siblings were made for life. I mean, what was that what was that whole dynamic like people looking for favors and asking for favors and trying to you know trying to get things from you did, did that really happen were people always in your in your life like that looking for stuff no no no, 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 no. The, the, the reality is you can't take that away in fact some people insult you because they felt at one i remember one guy calling me out on social media and when i went to the dm i realized that because again i couldn't check a lot of my dms but i realized that he had begged me for something before and i didn't respond so I was, because I was like, why is this guy so always antagonizing? Like, I, I don't know you from anywhere. You don't, what could I have done wrong that would make this guy so aggressive? Because again, like I said, I'm just doing my work. I me, mean, I don't care. See, just, let me, because wait till they don't put your mouth. Where you go put your mouth, now trouble you, they find. 
Somebody will say they are speaking Aousa, you cannot learn Aousa. I say, if they want me to know in Aousa, they will interpret it in English. There's no point me trying to know what is not my business. Know why you're here and focus on it. And that's why till tomorrow, no matter what you say about the government, you can always reference that it made us great. And for me, if I had sat down and I was dealing with politics, I was uh, the advisor, special media, uh, special advisor media and publicity. I was special advisor construction and rehabilitation. I was special advisor health and foreign affairs matter. I will not be able to deliver as a, as a special advisor photography. So my own role was to focus on my own assignment. So I was wondering, I said, this guy is antagonizing me. There must be something that is wrong there because this one, so I went to my DM and saw that he had asked me for money or begged me for something and I never responded. Oh, I didn't see it. So there were a lot of, you know, this kind of things where there's so much, there was pressure. But for me, again, it's fine. What I decided to do then was to pick on what I could handle which was my immediate creative community, which was photographers. So I rented an apartment for creatives, photographers in Abuja, in a very good location of Abuja. I paid for the apartment, furnished it, AC, beds, um, microwave, freezer, cooking gas, uh, cooking equipment, put everything in place, put books and uh, um, cameras and everything, and brought them together from different parts, Lagos and all. Some of them finished NYC. I said, don't go out of Abuja, stay in Abuja. And I started to incubate them. And today, all of them, over 90% of them are successful on a global scale. These were people that did not, could not even afford to see what their future looked like. But because of the intentionality of what, how I approached it, today they are successful. I mean, on a global scale. They are very, some of them are abroad now. Some of them are working with international organizations now. Some of them, they are all fulfilled because somebody chose to care. And not care, but be intentional about caring. I was going there, sometimes I would leave work, go there to train them. Sometimes I would come and tell them, let's do portfolio review. Sometimes I'll tell them, form a community around yourself, go and shoot, review it together, exchange ideas amongst yourself. And today, all of them, are, it's, it's incredible what their success story is. So for me, looking at that, is enough fulfillment. I could not help anybody, everybody. But the ones I helped, intentionally in the way I could, Getting resources from my opportunity with government, using it to support them. I see where they are today and I'm grateful I channeled my energy in that regard. And I organized trainings. I went around Nigeria doing unabashed trainings where I was doing trainings for photographers from, for free. I will feed them, I will bring them together, do everything, give them gifts, give them for photography equipment. I still met someone at the airport in Egypt last week. She said, I, have the, I still have the camera you gifted me. Mm. I am now, she's now a successful woman. Mm. I, didn't, I don't even know her. She said, she was ugly. She was so happy. She said, you don't know me? I said, no. She said, I was part of the training. I, I have the, she still has the camera. And I see a lot of them now doing amazing things. People come to my house and bring money. I say, I don't want money. I take the money. They say, no, I just came to give you gifts. Thank you for supporting our careers. And I take those money and I give it back to another set of creatives for them to blow them. I see all of these things and I'm grateful to God that I channeled my energy in that, in, you know, in that direction. We went to Makoko. We're doing photography courses for Makoko, feeding children in Makoko through photography. We're impacting lives in Makoko, collaborating with different organizations. For me, this is the definition of impact. So I don't feel pain by the people that say, oh, you never helped us. Who you help? I, I've helped a lot of people and I'm very grateful about it. And I'm grateful about what that help has turned to in their lives. All right. Uh, so what do uh, official photographers, as much as you define that space, what do official photographers of former presidents do when they are once their principal is out of office i mean in your case do they follow them to daura or is that the end is it sego bay until next time so 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 it, 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 it it's it's relative because it also depends on the context in a situation where the president has done only one time and he has the chance of coming back second time some photographers will follow you know keep following with the mind that when he becomes because there's still story to be told you want to tell a story of him, you know, leaving office first time, what he did. And then, for instance, um, um, John Mahama of Ghana, who is still coming back for president. Maybe the photographer would have still been following them around, around to tell the story with the hope that he's going to then become a president again. But in my own case, I'm a very, very, you know, unique person. For me, my, I, and I've told you my story, it's all in chapters. I've entered a new chapter, which is, to God be the glory, President Muhammad Buhari has um, successfully finished his tenure. He has gone back to, to retirements. 
Of course, after that, I've gone to um, see him. I've paid my regards. I followed him home. When he went back home, we were there together for days. And after that, I've gone again to visit him. But for me, I did. I went back to school to study a degree in Masters of Arts in Arts and Cultural Management. And I was in the Department of Creative, um, Cultural and Media Industries. Why? Because I believe so much that my life is tied to helping a lot of other creatives find themselves. I believe that I am here to multiply more bios in several other aspects of creative expression. So I have dedicated my time, which is why I earned a degree in arts management, to now begin to manage and support other creatives and I help them accelerate their journey. So if it took me four years, like you mentioned earlier on, I want to raise other creatives that it will take them one year to two years to becoming another buyer. So I am on the journey of multiplying myself into a crossboard within different creative expressions to make people realize that there are opportunities within this industry. To make people realize that across the verticals and across the spectrum, there are many, many potentials that are yet untapped. To open the eyes of people to learn more, do more, and earn more. So I am on that journey, and that's why we have the Madhouse, which we've created, which is a creative enterprise laboratory with the idea to help other creatives journey faster. I was privileged to have been able to journey through working with the president to come in this way. Other people, not everybody will go through working with the president. Some people will go through developing their creative skills. Some people will go through going through residency programs. Some people will go through going through the um, um, educational programs. Some people will go for masters abroad. Some people will go to meeting other people where they collaborate together. But the main ultimate goal is Nigeria and Africa is at a pivotal moment. We can no longer play catch up with the rest of the world. We need to accelerate in an unconventional way to meet up with the rest of the world and deliver unprecedented results such that we can begin to earn up more revenue into the country through our creative practice. And one of the things we are doing differently is that we want creatives to think enterprise. A lot of creatives are just thinking, oh, people come and meet me and say, what kind of aperture did you use to shoot? What camera body are you using? What lens type are you using? Baba, those ones are English. How much can you make from this? Be passionate. But when you take passion and you've developed the passion, think enterprise. Join passion and enterprise together and you'll become a successful entrepreneur. Nigeria does not necessarily need mass of creatives. Nigeria needs mass of creatives who are thinking enterprise and can help push the GDP forward. And creative industry must play a role in that space. Tech industry is doing that. The movie industry is doing that. But the creative industry is not just about music and movie. There are many other spectrum of that industry that must be developed. And by Omo Boro, yours sincerely, after working with the president, I've dedicated my life, including earning a degree, both in arts management and education administration, to being able to support these creatives and give them a ladder that can make them journey faster. Mm, great. Thank you. Uh, my final question. So you're sitting uh, in this awesome facility, this structure that you've built Mm, I think that in the opposite or in the environment or adjacent to uh, our school, the University of Lagos. That's correct, right? Yes or no? Very true. Good. Very so true. I just want to know, please, is University of Lagos handing out land to her alumni now? Because please, if there's a way to get land here, it's one of my dreams. And uh, I was here a long time. Uh, in fact, my, the first two numbers of my matric number are 96, meaning that I get admission in 1996. Please, how did you come by this land? It's one of my dreams. Is there a secret here somewhere? So, so, so I, I think first, it's um, uh, what, what we're doing with Madhouse is a collaboration with University of Lagos, which, like I said, is to support creatives both in University of Lagos and its environs, and then creatives in, 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 um, within Nigeria to do that crisscrossing, cross-collaboration and cross-pollination to help them, you know, exchange knowledge, exchange ideas, incubate each other, collaborate together to produce something. For instance, downstairs now, before I came up for this interview, is a, a creative photographer who is doing photogometry. Is, you can Google what photogometry means, but is working now with students of the University of Lagos and they are cross-pollinating to create an experiment that will yield a new body of work that the world is going to be 
amazed about. And this is one of our incubates, uh, the people we are incubating right now. Another one is doing what they call discovering, um, using microorganisms to discover uh, patterns that can be used for fabric. And is collaborating with a final year student of University of Lagos in visual arts, where they are working together to create fashion patterns that can be used in creating um, 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 fashion outfits. This for me is the essence of a collaboration with University of Lagos. And I'm sure you can speak with the management. I doubt if University of Lagos is sharing land or, 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 or additional land. But what we've done here is to um, um, have a mutual understanding of what we can do to support the creatives around this area. And that collaboration has already started to produce results. And we already have creatives, you know, students of the University of Lagos who work with models and are being paid their earning. So they've already started understanding what it means to be gainfully employed and to be earning as students. So we are doing a work study program with University of Lagos students. We are supporting their, their creatives to do more. A lot of them are not getting international exposure. They're already working with international organizations. They're getting um, international support now. We are building a whole lot of pipeline of curriculum that can also support, um, can be a top up to what they've been taught in their, in their institution. And that's the level of collaboration we have. So Madhouse here is a creative enterprise laboratory where the um, lecturers of University of Lagos and its environs, students of University of Lagos and its environments can co collaborate with other creatives, both locally and internationally, to learn more, do more, and earn more. And that way we are able to change the perspective and the perception of creatives from this part of the world. Awesome, awesome. Look, if um, if I could uh, if I could title this, if I could if I could somehow enshrine this into the minds of everybody who walks those streets of the University of Lagos, I would uh, that this is the proper way to go forward with giving back. It's not only about giving money. It's not only about giving resources. It's also giving the experience and the success that anybody has been. And so on your end to have that vision and from the end of the uh, leadership of the University of Lagos to also see that vision and to collaborate together is, is an awesome, awesome thing. And I can't wait to visit your facility if what I see online and from the pictures is, uh, is even close to what it is in reality. Then it seems, I mean, it's built out of containers. Container and clay, laterites. What, what, is that a creative expression or you were just, uh, was it a cost saving measure? It's a creative expression, also cost saving. The reality is we are in this part of the world where resources are not just flying around. We need to be very innovative in our approach to solving problems. And also, um, I am personally very passionate about the Nigerian story. So as much as we wanted to use container, we need to use laterite, uh, mud, clay, to express the Nigerianness of us, the originality. So when you go around the facility, you'll be seeing a lot of Nigerianness everywhere. Everything speaks to Nigeria. So when the German chancellor came into this facility, um, they call it the modern Nigerian architecture. Mm. So the modern Nigerian architecture. Mm. Thank you very much for doing this bio. I, I said that was final question, but let me ask you one last question. If one cannot reduce a man's journey, especially a journey that is still in progress, one cannot reduce it to a sound bite or to a grabby headline or to one sentence. And I do not mean, we do not mean to do that. But if I were to use a line for, for you, how would you tell your own story? I mean, it's obviously in technicality, in practical terms, it is even beyond grass to grace. I mean, you alluded to that in the, the beginning. This was even below grass. This wasn't even carpet grass, according to you. This was Koriko. That was what came to my mind when you said that. I mean, that was, that was even <laughs> below grass. I mean, so to say uh, grass to grace is one way, but how would you put it if you had to put it in one sentence? Or a couple of sentences your journey so far i'll say bio the one helped by god i like i like i like <laughs> please say that again <laughs> i like i like awesome you couldn't have said it better uh bio thanks a lot it was awesome doing this and i hope to see you in person very soon Thank you very much. I really, really appreciate your time and thank you for doing what you do. Thank you to um, the amazingness of your team. 
thank you again. I will say is right behind the camera. Mr. Sholani Mashawan has been a big inspiration to the photography industry. It's not just because he's here. He has genuinely supported that industry. He has supported a lot of us. And when I said to him, I was trying to prostrate to him. He said, why am I doing this? I said, you have, it's a step, full step you have laid down. A lot of us are following and you, he has genuinely done that. And people like that are models for us not to give up because we can't disappoint them. They've laid and um, bear the price. They've gone to the cross and then, you know, resurrection must happen. So we must show that truly they did not just bear the sacrifice in vain. So we have, we owe it to them and owe it to future generation to do it right. So as much as I will leave my house at 5 a.m. or leave very early to be here to do things right, it's because of people like this who have already set a tone for us that we cannot go below. So we must take it because a student must be far better than its teacher. So we owe it to them. So a big thank you to them. And thank you so much for what you do. I will see you in Dallas. <laughs> I will see you in Lagos. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah, bye. <laughs> the Yoruba people say that Igi kan ke dagbo she, which means that one tree does not a forest make. It takes more than just one tree to make an entire forest, which is to say that it takes more than just one person or even one team's effort to make this thing work across two continents. We're sitting here in the United States. We just had an interview, a seamless interview with somebody who was sitting in Lagos, you know, just in the University of Lagos in Akoka. And that was seamless. And so I'd like to thank my team. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, the second unit production team led by, uh, powered by, engineered by Dr. Shola Anima Shao of Shola Animasha Photography Studios. Thank you very much. And all the members of the team on that side. I'd like to thank Omo Talabi and 1908 Connect Limited. Thank you. I'd also like to say thank you to the Teju Babyface team here in Dallas. Guys, uh, thank you very much. It, it takes more than uh, just one person. It takes teams to make this work seamlessly. So thank you. Okay, let's get into the wisdom roundup. Uh, the Yoruba say again, <laughs> You find me going a lot to the Yoruba Se, the Yoruba Se. We are the ultimate fruit and product of what we expose ourselves to over the aggregate course of our lives. And you see all that, all that, all that music that I'm listening to, all that uh, King Sonia Day and Ebenezer Obey and Orlando Owo and all that Orlando Julius, all that Ainla Omawura that I am listening to, and all that time spent uh, with my parents. This is the aggregate of it so uh, it's not an apology i'm just giving you the background to uh the yoruba say given how i grew up in lagos it wasn't like i grew up in ajawa our city in obomosho in the obomosho area no i grew up in lagos but i i keep going to this i want babo once a week with the yoruba say because it's the fruit and the aggregate of the way i was raised and i guess i say this more to people who are concerned about the fact that our language and our culture seems to be dying or our languages seem to be dying. Our kids are not speaking our languages anymore. I'm just saying that with some concerted effort in that direction, surrounding them with the, with the, not only the appurtenance, but with all the structures and the support of that culture will probably birth in them a love for the culture and maybe even the language. But I digress. That's not what I wanted to talk about. Remember, I started from saying the Yoruba say, I want you babo once a week. You know any Ludo do any. Which means that the greatest truth that you can tell yourself comes from within yourself. Which is why I tell people that at some point in your life, while I advocate mentorship, in fact, I wrote an entire book about mentorship. Forget principles, find a mentor. At some point in your life, you will have to stand on your own and by yourself and respect your own decisions. Why? Because the truth that comes from inside you, assuming that you've been well prepared and schooled by masters and mentors, is the greatest truth that you can have. Inueni, Lododueni, what comes from inside you is your greatest truth. 
I say this in reference to Bayo Omoboriowo's interview, which if you didn't watch again, you're out of sequence. See that interview with Bayo Omoboriowo, a guy who went from, he just went from deprivation and very a very modest background to the highest echelon, to the pantheon of the photographic great on the African continent. And Bayo kept referring to the fact that his journey seemed predestined that he would ask God, he would speak to God, he would listen to God, he would listen to his inner man and he would be directed, that his journey seemed directed. King Sonia Day said, Bere o bere, bere o bere, bere o bere, ore bere o bere, lo wo orie, koto shon kon, akun le nyon le bo. That just means again what I alluded to. Ask your being. Have deep conversations with yourself. Ori in the Yoruba parlance stands for the creative center of your being. Your creator in a manner of speaking. Ask your head. Ask the being that created you. Ask your being. In short, have these internal conversations and these introspective moments with yourself before you take any decisions in life especially major decisions. You know, before you leave one place to go to another place, have these conversations with yourself. Before you marry that person, have these conversations with yourself. Before you take on that career, have these conversations with yourself. Bayo told us how he wanted to leave wedding photography and photography around the party circuit after a while. He just felt like he had maybe kind of outgrown that. He didn't feel comfortable in that position. It wasn't like he wasn't making money, but something else was calling to him. So he had these conversations, these deep conversations with himself. And yet, photography, wedding photography was lucrative. There was a friend of his at that point who was telling him, do you know how much they pay me for weddings? And yet Bayo kept saying, no, there is something more for me. And he followed that direction, that instinct. And the rest, as they say, is history. So I'm saying that for you today, have these conversations with yourself. In short, pray. And when I say pray, it doesn't mean falling down on your knees and closing your eyes and doing all of that, you know, all this drama. No, just have these introspective moments with yourself. Speak to yourself. We are all different. We are created differently. And depending on your theology, we probably had a life or several lives even before this life. And we may have several after this life. So you are a continued journey across several planes of existences. If you believe in that theology, the Yoruba people definitely do. So they say, ask your head, what did you choose on the other plane before you got to this dimension or into this dimension? In short, to round this all up, the crux of this is don't do stuff simply because number one, you see other people doing it because other people seem to be successful in doing it. As a younger person, that is not a problem because as a younger person to find our feet in life, we often go into something because other people, you know, attract us to that thing. That is good for young people. But at some point, as you grow older, you must begin to find your own authenticity again from within yourself, which is why one of my favorite sayings is, and you know this if you followed me for a while, is that life begins at 40. And the flip side of that coin for that saying is that a fool at 40 is a fool forever. In other words, we expect that by the time you've lived your life up until you're 40 or 40 -ish or circa 40, you must have done enough dabbling, experimentation, going into things for you to figure out what you are about, for you to begin to have these conversations with yourself and with your own being. So in conclusion, trust yourself. Even when nobody has done that thing which you intend to do or that you intend to do, trust your instincts. Are you going to make mistakes? Of course you're going to make mistakes. Sometimes you're going to look back and even blame yourself, but don't. Hindsight is an oppressor. Vision is always clear. Vision is always 2020 when you are looking at it later, when you have the benefit of hindsight. Hindsight. But in the moment, if you feel like doing something and it's strong within you, and then you've had these introspective conversations with yourself, you've prayed about it, you've asked your being. If in the end you're convinced you should go in that direction, even when it seems nobody has gone in that direction, then go. But I must add, Please do not gamble. There is a difference between gambling and risk-taking. You must take risks in life. 
There are no rewards without risk taking, but don't gamble. What is the difference? Gambling is when you put everything you have in one basket. And if that thing doesn't work or it goes burst, then you are finished. Don't do that. Especially when you have dependents, when you are a married man or a married person with people who are depending on you to live or to survive. Don't take gambles. Risk taking, on the other hand, is when you endeavor or when you venture. And if that thing doesn't work out, you will still suffer losses, but it will not wipe you out. It might keep you quiet for a little while, but sooner or later, or rather sooner rather than later, you are able to recoup your losses and then try again. Anything that will wipe you out completely after you try it is gambling. That is not risk taking. So take risks, don't gamble. Speak to yourself, have these internal conversations. And once you're convinced, and when I say convinced, it's not as if you'll be 100% convinced. It is just that in light of all the other options, that option will seem like your most viable option and it will be the one that pushes and compels you the most. Having done that, go for it. If you don't go for it, you might not get it. In fact, might, you will definitely not get it. People who don't drive out to the airport do not catch planes. All right, that's it. I'll see you on the next one.